So, Revelation chapter 3, beginning tonight in verse 7. We did only get through the church of Sardis. <clears throat> but it is, well, this, this, uh, the book of Revelation is precious, obvious, for obvious reasons. Um, but it's, it, among many other things, it's a letter to you. It really is. It's, and uh, we've, since we started it, looking at, uh, looking at the faithful church, well, sorry, started it looking at the seven churches, um, and we're on church number six here, which is the faithful church, uh, Philadelphia. So last week we looked at Sardis, um, and kind of the, the time in church history, which really from the Reformation on, the church began to die, and it, was, it became, and as we saw, the dead church. It had a name that it was alive, but it was dead. And it speaks of kind of that time during the medieval ages where a lot of death occurred in, uh, in Jesus' name. There was wars, there was all these false teachings that were embraced, and ultimately denominations and um, traditions, different sects of uh, Christianity um, and what they would call Protestants. Um, breaking away from the Catholic Church was awesome. That was great. But it brought about new uh, traditions, new rituals, new problems <laughs> with denominations. So it, it really did begin to look and, and was... Uh, well, it was dead from the inside. Outwardly, they, it looked good. And just like Jesus told the Pharisees in His day, you can wash uh, the outside all you want, but the inside is dead men's bones. And that's the church at Sardis. Um, the joke is that they were a bunch of sardines. And, and uh, as you get into Philadelphia, one of the things here that they're, uh, well, one of the really interesting things is it's the only other church where there's nothing bad said of them. There's nothing critical. Um, Jesus doesn't have any harsh words. The first one that Jesus didn't have anything negative to say to was Smyrna, remember. We looked at Smyrna, and that was because Smyrna was this persecuted church. And so... They were going through things that you and I couldn't even imagine, and it strengthened them it, so much so that Jesus, in his letter to them, didn't have anything negative. You know, you can look at these in in some ways, all of the seven letters as report cards from Jesus, and so they they didn't get any bad grades. They were doing uh, well in the sight of Jesus, which that's that's all that matters. Um, and so Philadelphia here is the, is the, sec, the next church that Jesus uh, only commends. He doesn't uh, have anything to rebuke them or to uh, come down on them like he did to Sardis, like we've seen pretty heavy with uh, some of the churches before Thyatira uh, being the place where Satan dwells and all of that harsh language when he does come against and have negative things to say. Nonetheless, remember, keep in mind, these are churches. And so, <laughs> they're written for you and written for me. So coming off of the dead uh, church, Sardis, now we get into verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, I write, These things saith he that is holy. He that is true, and the, he that has the key of David. That's a significant thing um, that he brings up here. Possibly the first time as you're studying through Revelation where you really get the Jewish feel that the book is going to ultimately, really, <laughs> it gets a whole lot more Jewish 
Um, why is there 144,000? Only one reason. <laughs> There's 12 tribes of Israel. And so um, it's going to get even more. And this is kind of the opening, the, the uh, glimpse or hint that this book is very Jewish. <laughs> this book is very, uh, and Israel is become center stage. And this, he that is true and he that has the key of David. He that opens, verse 7, he that opens, well, the end of verse 7, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. Behold, look, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. But they lie. They, they, that is a lie. Be, behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation or tribulation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. To him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of God, my God, and he shall go no more out and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that has an ear, let him hear what the churches say unto the churches. <laughs> what the Spirit says unto the churches. And always... Take note of the plural, pluralism. Though he's writing to one church, Philadelphia, he ends each each one. When he wrote to Sardis, same thing. When he wrote to those churches, he ends with, "He who has an ear, let him hear what he has to say to the churches." What the Spirit would say to the churches. It's mm -hmm. it's not like the letter of Philadelphia was only for them. This the and the letter to Sardis was only. For them, it was, it was to be read among all seven churches. And it's to be read by all believers today. All of the churches today. We all have a little bit of Sardis in us. We all have a little bit of Laodicea. We're going to see that maybe tonight. <laughs> we all have a little bit of Ephesus. All of those, those churches that we've looked at previously... Philadelphia is the one that everyone wants to claim. That's our church, Philadelphia. We're hanging on. Be careful of that. And, and I was kind of reminded of that listening to uh, yeah, Pastor Chuck teaching through this. Um, that's spiritual pride. To, to say, I'm Philadelphia, and bummer for the rest of you guys. <laughs> You know, or we are Philadelphia. Oh, you guys just got to get all your stuff together. No, because Smyrna was also commended, and they were persecuted. And so there's church. And just like today, we may be a faithful, believing, Bible teaching church, but there's Smyrnas today in other countries, most of them, and some here that are just going through persecution whether it's you know getting sued by the state or facing uh, you know lawsuits that happens and it's persecution not maybe not physical but it's persecution and so they are they remain faithful in those areas but we are to remain faithful um, and the whole the whole uh, admonition for you and I is to remain faithful. First two that we see even before um, he gets into the key of David, 
he that is holy, he that is true. It's important to note that Jesus is holy. Jesus is true. He has all authority. In fact, holiness is an incredible uh, theme to look at biblically in your, in your uh, you know, the, the, what do you call that thing? Where you look up the words and where they're, concordance. Where they're concordance thank you. In, the, in your concordance, you just go through and see holy and all the times it's mentioned. And I, I love the picture in Isaiah chapter 6 of Isaiah coming up into the very throne room of God and he hears what we just sang. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> and I've always thought of that as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But I heard a, a really cool one. is Jesus, because this in context is talking about Jesus being holy. He that is true. He that is holy. And Jesus is holy at His birth when He came. And Jesus is holy at His death. And He is holy today. So in heaven we're going to be singing that same thing. And it's like Jesus, past, present, future, you're holy. And it's, it's the holiness of Jesus. Um, well, God, Almighty, Jesus is God. He has, and He that is truth. Um, a good definition of what truth is is when the word and the deed become one and there's only one <laughs> that truly lives up to that when the word and the deed became one Jesus Christ he did what he said and said what he did he, he didn't make any there's not one promise that he didn't keep and so that's, that's and he said you know I am the way the truth and the life so he is the truth. But then there's this whole concept of the key of David, which again points us back, brings us back to, in this case, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 22. It's kind of an interesting phrase. You might have it already at the bottom of your margins in your Bible. Isaiah 22, uh, beginning at verse 20. It's kind of interesting, this whole idea of the open doors and the key of David. Well, in Isaiah 20, 22, sorry, verse 20. <clears throat> so Isaiah 22, 20, it says, It shall come to pass in the day that I will call my servant Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, and I will clothe him with your robe and strengthen him with your girdle, and I will uh, commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David, this is Isaiah 22, 22. The key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, so he shall open and none shall shut. And he shall shut and none shall open. I will fasten him as a nail in, sure, in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And they shall hang upon him all the glory of his father's house, the offspring and the issue, all vessels of small quantity, from the vessels of cups even to the, all the vessels of flagons. So, uh, Isaiah 22, verses 20 through 24, gives us a glimpse into what Isaiah was prophesying and who, um, talking about, Eliakim, who's, who's being given the authority, um, the key of David, if you will, to sit on the throne of Israel. He would be kind of uh, given, and, and just as it says, the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's spoken of of someone else, isn't it? Isaiah chapter 9 the Christmas cards that all say all say it in there. Unto us a child is born, a, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. What does this all mean? He will be given. Well, and just as we read in Revelation, he has the key of David. But even more than that, what Mary was told from Gabriel, the angel, that you will have a son. You're going to call his name Jesus, and he will sit upon the throne of David. 
That is yet to happen. That's what's exciting. Jesus came to Bethlehem. He was born of a virgin. He is yet to sit on the throne of David. And that's why we're so interested. That's why we look to, at Israel and we're excited as we know that <laughs> there is a throne of David and he is yet to sit on it. Some of them in Israel are still looking for another Messiah. And they're confused. They're being sadly being uh, totally set up for the Antichrist who will come and they will think he's the one to sit on the throne of David. He's and Jesus. ultimately, yeah, the, first coming. the counterfeit Christ. That's what the Antichrist is going to do. He's going to come and, and basically fill all their uh, earthly wishes of world peace, of one world government, of, of all of that. <laughs> and so, um, but it's only God, and I love this, that has the key of David that will sit on the throne of David, rule and reign on the throne of David, but he's the only one that opens a door that no man can shut. And shut a door that no man can open. God is the only one that does that. Um, and we gotta, we got to learn to recognize it like Paul the Apostle did. We were just talking about this on Tuesday night too. How that when God closed the door for him not to go into a certain area... Remember that? The Lord forbade me. Uh, the Spirit forbade us to go. And you're kind of like, how did He do that? Just shut a door in your face? <laughs> well, it's interesting as you, as you do a little further studying, you see that Satan was buffeting Him. Satan was involved. And God, we see how Satan is just a puppet <laughs> that God uses even to, to stop us and close doors and say, nope, don't go there. <laughs> and so, uh, it's important that we understand God will open doors, and uh, I wrote my notes, when God closes a door, we have a tendency to try and kick it open again. But we have to uh, recognize and see when the, when the doors close and when the doors open and he does. He, he gives us, uh, in his wisdom, he gives us uh, vision. He kind of gives us these different <clears throat> hints towards him opening. Whether it's through his word, through fellow believers, God gives us that. And of course the old adage that uh, blessed are the flexible for they shall not break. Right? It's so true. To just be flexible. And don't be so hard pressed on you're going to do this. You're going to, you know, and, and be uh, so set in your ways. That's, again, a lack of faith. And it can be an abundance of pride. It can be something that we're walking by sight all of a sudden and not by faith. So, he opens doors that no man shuts and he shuts those doors that no man opens. And of course he says the same thing to Philadelphia that he said to many of the other churches, well to Sardis and a lot of the other churches, I know your works. That is, that you're doing the Word of God. You're not just hearing it. You're not just listening or writing it or, or uh, saying it out loud. You're doing it. Your works, that's what that speaks of. Is, is putting it into practice where and God alone, Jesus sees that and knows it more than anyone. I've, I've always remind myself, I have no idea why any of you come. <laughs> Only God knows that. I know that you do come and I just like, I don't know why anybody would do some of the things that they do, but God knows, doesn't He? That's motive. We, and and we have to be careful that we don't judge the motives because we don't know the motives behind everybody's heart and what, what we're doing, right? So, again, it's amazing how this book, I'm reminded, you learn more and more about Jesus Christ. The nature, the character. That's the, this is what Revelation should be about. 
It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And not some, you know, futuristic book that we can sometimes make into a sci-fi film in our head and try and put things into more of a, you know, I don't know, Hollywoodized version. It's Jesus. And it's seeing that He opens doors, He closes doors, He knows my works, and He set before them an open door. And you have that no one shuts, for thou hast a little strength. I love that. Strengthen the faith that remains. If you're here tonight, maybe you've got just enough strength to keep your eyes open. Be encouraged. He sees your works. He sees you. And you've kept my word, he goes on in verse 8, right? And have not denied my name. Somebody comes to mind. Who did deny his name? Peter, right? Three times. Yet, Jesus forgave him. Jesus restored him. Peter would become a pillar in the church. He, he's the same promise that's given to this church, actually. <laughs> Peter himself would become. Uh, in verse 12, he alludes to that. But <clears throat> the pillar in the church... Uh, at one time, denied the name of Jesus, even knowing Him. So you're, you're in good company. Mm. We're in good company. Okay. But being faithful, keeping, your, keeping His Word, holding to His Word, seeing that it's precious, more precious than silver, more costly than gold, to be sought after more than millions of dollars, to be worked toward more than any other thing. There's nothing more precious than His Word. That's why we keep it. That's why they kept it. Then verse 9 gets me off into a tangent. Because I've met people, I've had long arguments and discussions with friends, well-meaning Christian brothers that I really do consider brothers. And here is a hard verse, because knowing what the Scripture says, and behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not. See, this is tough. Why? Because there are those who teach in the church, and those who believe that God is finished with Israel, that Israel is forfeited the promises of God, and that the church now is Israel. It's replacement theology. And it's a, it's just uh, a false teaching. It's dangerous because of verses like this. Because see, you put yourself in a position, you don't even realize, all you think you're doing is seeing history for what it is, and uh, <laughs> reading even more into it than, than you ought and you don't realize you're saying you are Jews, but you're not. All of the promises to Israel are to you now as the church. No. And when you go through Revelation, actually, when you go through the Bible as a whole, be sensitive to the distinction between the church and Israel. Because they're very similar. They're, they are in ways, but they're very distinct. The, the the, all of the promises to Israel, well, not all of them, sorry. <laughs> the promises that were specific for Israel are unconditional. Starting with Abraham falling into a deep sleep and God passing through the torches to keep His covenant that He will bring from him a nation, Israel. The very beginning of, of Israel as a nation was God it was one-sided. It was an unconditional covenant, we would call that. There are other covenants we know that if they kept the Word of God, then the blessings would follow. But ultimately, them as a nation have many promises throughout the Old Testament that are unconditional. And curses. I always like to point out and remind, I, I think my dad's the first one I heard remind, remind ourselves what do you do with the curses? You want to 
receive all of the blessings that are in the Bible about Israel, but what about the curses? You have to then re receive the curses just as well. Oh no, we don't, we don't claim those. <laughs> so you, you fall into very slippery and very dangerous ground. Why would some go that route and say that the church replaces Israel? I believe that it's a lack of faith. I believe it's a lack of impatience. Or sorry, it's a sign of impatience. Because what does he say um, in verse 10, the next verse? Because you've kept the word of my patience. How long has God put up with Israel? <laughs> a long, long, long time. Whereas, and, and you can see how believers that read the Word of God, that know it, they go, there's, there's just no way. <laughs> he, he's done with them. And it's why uh, Paul the Apostle went out of his way in Romans, in the book of Romans, and took three whole chapters to hammer this point home. God is not finished with Israel. Romans chapter 9, chapter 10, and chapter 11. Those three chapters, he goes into great detail about God is not finished. And he even does the whole hypothetical. You know, God is, is God finished? Let's, what if God is finished with Israel? And he says, God forbid. You know, it's, it's uh, just in the same way he does, should we just continue to sin so that grace abounds more? The same word is used when he says, is God forgetting and all done with Israel, come finished with them? No, God forbid, perish the thought. Don't even go there. God is long-suffering, He's patient, and I believe he's, He teaches us patience through looking at the book of Numbers, seeing what Moses went through, looking at the book of, well, once we get into the book of Judges, Seeing all that God has put up with. <coughs> and it's encouraging, but always just be careful of the false teachers, the false teachings that are out there that God is, you know, He's, he's finished with Israel. No, no need to, you know, study all of that. Because um, the Old Testament, all of a sudden, becomes irrelevant to many of those that, that would teach that, and they're much more concerned with the New Testament. Um, there's an old, old book, but a very, very good book by Hal Lindsey, um, called The Road to Holocaust, um, and it goes much deeper, much more eloquent than I could about how dangerous it truly is to take on this whole thing. And we just, verse 9 just touches on it. And Jesus would say, the synagogue of Satan. That is not mincing words. He is, that's a harsh, harsh rebuke. And um, it's a warning in the middle of God commending Philadelphia. You've been faithful. You're still looking for my return. <laughs> You're still holding on to the Word. I'm going to keep you. Verse 10, verse 10 goes on. I also will keep you from the hour of temptation. That's the tribulation which will come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. It's an illusion The the hour of tri uh, temptation or the hour of tribulation is an allusion to what we're going to look at in chapter 6 through 19. It's the great tribulation. And it's, it's ultimately the wrath of God that will come upon a God-rejecting world. They will be kept. And you and I will be kept. See, that's another false teaching that people fall into very easy, and that is that somehow we're going to go through part of the tribulation or we're going to see <coughs> some of these things unfold before Jesus returns. 
And really, it's uh, you have a whole lot of scriptures that are hard to deal with. <laughs> and, and one of them is how that God says very openly in 1 Thessalonians 5.9 and in Romans 5.9 He alludes to, You are not appointed unto wrath. I always like those because you can remember 5.9. 1 Thessalonians and Romans 5.9 You are not appointed unto the wrath that is to come. So the wrath of the Lamb, which we're going to get into in chapter 6, a couple months from now, we'll be in chapter 7. <laughs> we're going to get into and look at the wrath of God that will come. Philadelphia is not going to be there. They're going to be kept from it. In fact, the church is caught up. Next week, well, I, I don't think we're going to... We're probably going to keep Laodicea for next week. But... Chapter 4, once we get into that, it starts with that hereafter, with the things to come. Remember Revelation 1.19, the outline for the book. We've been in the middle of the things that are. These are the churches that are right now in the present. And, the, and it's exciting when you're looking at Philadelphia because you get glimpses of the rapture. And that's what he's, he's promising them. How that they will be kept. <laughs> he's going to keep them and He will keep you from the great tribulation that's coming. And it is important to note it's all the world that will be judged in that time of great, the great tribulation. To try them that are earth dwellers. That's an important note at the end of verse 10. Do not be one that dwells upon this earth. Well, what do you mean? I'm on earth. My house is here. Yeah, don't dwell here. <laughs> be one that's looking to Jesus. Amen? Be one that's just a pilgrim passing through. <laughs> only one life to live and it will soon pass. It's only what's done for Jesus Christ that will last. Only one life that we have. Don't be... That's one thing as you go through the book of Revelation. You keep an eye out for that. Earth dwellers. You do not want to be an earth dweller. One that dwells upon the, the earth. Those that dwell upon the earth. See, the Holy Spirit, what does He do in you? Dwells in you. That's the idea. Is your heart all wrapped up in this earth? The things of the earth? What did, for, in 1 John, what did the Spirit say through, through him there? Don't, do not love the world or the things of the world. But we have to live in it. <laughs> now I'm not saying it's you know, not to enjoy the beauty of creation, the, the things that come along, but don't find yourself dwelling there. And lingering there. And, and kind of your heart begins to be set on earth. Or on earthly things. Uh, set your mind on things above. Paul the Apostle wrote. Not on things of the earth. And that is a life of faith. That is a walk of faith. That's a vision. And, and a, a 2 Corinthians 5.7 Keeps coming back up. 2 Corinthians 5 7. For me, at least this week. Walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5 7. And that is, that's it. <laughs> Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Walk by faith, not by sight. Amen? It's, it's, we can find ourselves getting caught up with the things of the earth and even. Uh, loving the things of the earth as, as in First John he warns us not to do. And the, the word quickly could actually be more uh, in verse 11. The word quickly, behold I come quickly, could be more accurately suddenly or assuredly. <laughs> He's coming and it's going to be suddenly. But what's what's Always keep in mind, and it's great that we're going through 1 Thessalonians with the men right now, 
to keep in mind that you are children of the day. Because he goes into that. We, we haven't gotten to chapter 5 yet. It'll be a few months before we're at chapter 5. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in 1 Thessalonians 5, you want to be children of the day. Why? Because he will come as a thief in the night, and the children of the night are going to be swept off. You know, they're, they're not going to be watching, they're not going to be praying. He will be as a thief in the night to them, not to you, not to me. For one thing, we will be with him. <laughs> We're going to be with him when he comes, but he is coming. And uh, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, right? Uh, but we hold fast. Another thing that, that's, that's, I think, really important to note about verse 11. Hold fast which thou hast. What do they already have? A crown. Do you know that you already have a crown? But what does he warn Philadelphia? What does he warn Calvary Chapel about? What does he warn his church about? That no man take your crown. It can happen. Happened to Solomon, or I mean Saul, the first king. David received the crown, didn't he? Saul was <laughs> on his way. Happened to, uh, the first, first time I can think of it is Esau. <laughs> Sold his birthright, his brother swept, swept in and took it. So a man, someone can come along and rob you of, it may not be your heavenly crown, but... What, it, what it's speaking of there is, is really the rewards. And it's real easy for us, again, to get caught up in the things of the earth and we sell mm -hmm. some, some jewel that we have in heaven for you know, a, a bowl of oatmeal. <laughs> because we were hungry in that moment. We can be a little bit like Esau. Um... And it happens. It's important to, to make note of that. And I think they didn't even realize it. Sometimes we act as if we will receive that crown one day. We already have it. It's yours. <laughs> but you inherit it how? By faith. It's a walk of faith. It's again, comes back to walk by faith, not by sight. So, and of course... Him that overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And a good, I mentioned Peter earlier, and he's a good example. Because he didn't go and hang himself. Judas did. They both, in a way, betrayed. They both, one just did it, you know, behind Jesus' back, kind of, and, and, but the response was the difference, right? Peter was an overcomer. Judas, not so much. He was overcome by the despair, depression, the grief, and the, the shame, ultimately. And so, uh, he will make you, and he did, he made Peter one of the pillars in the church. And he'll do the same for you and for me. Any that overcome, um, and it's, it's a precious, again, all of these are precious promises. That's why I titled the message. Uh, this is a letter for you, a letter to you. Because these are promises from God to you, if you will overcome, if you will walk by faith, if you decide and choose not to dwell upon this earth, but that you have a home in glory that outshines the sun. Like the old song says. You know, we have such a great, incredible hope. And He's going to make us pillars in the temple of God. And He'll go no more out, and I will write, He shall go no more out, and I will write upon Him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God. And here it is again, very Jewish which is the new Jerusalem come down out of heaven. The verse was 
Verse 12. Yeah. Just continuing kind of to review that a second time. <laughs> the New Jerusalem. What's wrong with Jerusalem? It need, just like the world, just like the earth, <laughs> there will be a new heaven and a new earth. Amen? <laughs> and it needs to happen. What's going to be so exciting, what's going to be so incredible, it's hard to imagine, is that Jesus Christ will rule and reign upon this earth. The earth as we know it now. It's going to be totally revised. It's going to be totally renewed. <laughs> but it's, it's, again, eyes cannot, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard the incredible things that God has in store for His people, to them that overcome. He's going to write upon you a new name. I love that. I will write upon Him my new name. And it's something that Jewish rabbis and scholars for centuries, millennia have argued over, and for a long time they wouldn't mention, some of them still orthodox today, don't mention the name of God. You know, what they believe, Yahweh, or Jehovah, or the Adonai. They have all of their Hebrew, you know, texts, but you can't even say them. It's, it's holy. It's complete. And he has a new name. Learn all of those as you can, you know, here on earth now. Because even when you get up there, even when, when we're there and we've overcome... He's going to give us His new name and write that new name on us, which is awesome. And there's some debate, I was reading a commentary that says, I will write upon Him my new name, may mean give you another name. Which, either way, it's cool. <laughs> either way, God can rename me any day. <laughs> but, but I like to think too, just because this is Jesus, and he's writing the letter, I'll write upon you my new name. And it's very possible he'll have some new name that we'll, we'll be able to, you know. And it, it's, it speaks of, again, the intimacy. He's our father. We are his children. You know, we can call him Abba, Father. We can call him Daddy. We can call him Friend. Let's talk about incredible, mind-blowing. And it's, again, He just, it's the Spirit that gives us the ear. Verse 13, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. It's the Spirit that makes this relationship possible. The Holy Spirit, you know, why, why in the Old Testament they, they would be so distant? And one of the reasons some you know, speculate, and I, I believe it to be true, is that David, you know, would, he was suicidal at times. He was depressed. He was on the run, but he would rejoice. And he has such joy. And zo Why was that? Well, the Spirit didn't dwell in him like he does in you. The Spirit would fall upon him at times. The Spirit would anoint him at times. But it's different. Why? Because Jesus had not come and died on the cross. See, it makes the gospel again. It makes Jesus in the death that He died. It was so that you and I would understand and come to life. The, the old King James, I love the, old, the, the word, quickens us. He makes us alive. And that's the Spirit coming in and opening the eyes, opening the hearts, opening the ears. It's the Spirit that, that will cause us to hear just what it is out of Philadelphia that He wants us to hear. And it's not Philadelphia, USA, just so you guys know. <laughs> but it's, it's the church. And that is another interesting note about uh, Philadelphia and Smyrna, the only two that didn't have any bad said about them. They're the only two that you can still go and visit 
that are still around. Pretty incredible. Of the seven churches, the, they're called something way different now. It's not Philadelphia, it's not Smyrna. But the area that these places were, just kind of an interesting observation that <laughs> they are, they're the only ones of the seven that are there. And I don't think that's an accident. <laughs> Jesus didn't have anything bad to say to him, so that's a big compliment, isn't it? Well, thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. And we do, we again pray for those, we pray for those that couldn't be here tonight for whatever reason, Lord, you just minister to them and uh, touch and heal. We lift up Dad again to you and pray for his, his uh, the sciatica and that he would be back uh, in fellowship and back with us being able to get around. And Lord, help them to keep exercising it, even though it hurts, I know. Lord, I pray you just uh, give him the strength that he needs. And uh, we just lift it all, all up to you. Give us ears to hear, even as we sing these songs, Lord, may we be listening at the same time, Lord, as we're worshiping, just that you would speak to our hearts, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.